fiction is truth, the peculiar, the norm, and where poisons invoke euphoric spiritual dream states. Encounter the unbelievable, the unexpected, and the remarkable, for this journey will truly be beyond bizarre. Good health is a perpetual preoccupation of the human species. We turn to our health professionals for wellness. In primitive tribes, that health professional is the shaman. Traditionally, the shaman fills a number of roles, at times being a priest, magician, healer, and metaphysician. Modern medical science has yet to supplant many of these traditional methods, but as the millennium approaches, a number of more advanced people are turning to archaic rituals and mystical sources of healing and wisdom. A quick overview of some of the world's health practices yields many that are so bizarre that few modern people would even consider them. For example, there is a woman in New Guinea who wears the foot of her dead husband, using its perceived supernatural power to ward off evil spirits. In addition, the superstitious villagers devoured the man when he died, hoping that his warrior traits would be passed on to them. A number of questionable healing practices are traditionally applied to the function of blood. The operation of opening a vein for bloodletting, called venesection, originated in Egypt. The practice became popular in the Middle Ages and still survives in places like Saudi Arabia. The concept is to rid the body of contaminated blood. Looking like a devilish jester, Senor Sangornagura is a shamanistic figure in Malaysia. His spellbinding performance mesmerizes the audience. The crowd is ready for it. He actually sells his own blood, smeared on swatches of paper as a sort of elixir or universal cure-all. Not all primitive health care is of such dubious origin, however. As a matter of fact, at least 25% of the drugs found at your local pharmacy are derived from plants originally used by native folk cultures. By far, the planet's richest pharmacopoeia resides in the rainforests of the Amazon. Wade Davis, a Harvard ethnobotanist, studies such ancient folk cultures and the plants they use for survival. On this expedition along the Urubamba River in Peru, he is searching for a rare plant called the Shamiro. Accompanied by John Titchener, an expert on South American rivers, Wade is hopeful that the Machaginga Indians will be able to lead him to a specimen of this rare vine. Finally, the Americans reach their destination to find the Machaganga eager to assist in their quest. A hard trek through the dense jungle results in success when they find the sought-after Shamiro vine. John, this is it. Shamiro, this is it right here. And who knows what kind of sweetener it's you got. Mean, it may not be from sugar at all. It's not from sugar at all. It's some kind of strange chemical that no one's it's analyzed. No one. I, the, look, that's, look, follow this back. That's, that same vine, look, it's going all the way up to the canopy. That's what we have to get. The natives use Shamiro as a natural sweetener, but Wade believes the plant's utilities may go way beyond that. A relative of the Shamiro, located in Brazil, was found to contain anti-carcinogenic properties. Not all traditional plants are so benign. Shamans use a variety of hallucinogenic plants to achieve altered states that allow them to transcend the mundane, communicate with spiritual entities, and effect cures of the ill and injured.
Endemic wild plants are also used in ceremonial spirit journeys by individuals seeking visions of the right future path. Such spirit journeys are serious rituals and require help from a number of people for several days. Robin Novickus and David Robinson are Native Americans, members of the Kwayasu Shoshone tribe in California. Robin is a doctoral candidate in cultural anthropology and expert on the Kwayasu tribe. David is a shaman, tribal elder. His anthropological traditionalists are researching ways to comprehend and preserve their cultural heritage. They are about to engage in an ancient ceremony using toxic datura. The plant must be prepared in a very tedious, traditional manner to eliminate the toxins that can cause serious illness and even death. Datura, also known as Jinsen weed, is a member of the deadly nightshade family that has been used through the centuries by a number of different cultures to different ends. The Yaqui Indians in northern Mexico have used Datura to experience the sensation of flight, and thieves in ancient India used its seeds to drug intended victims. In a quiet location, Joseph Shybrown, also Shoshone, contemplates the coming ceremony. Joseph will ingest a Datura brew to embark on a one-time life spirit journey as a traditional rite of passage. This is the Shoshone way to envision one's role in life. On the evening before the ceremony, Joseph thanks the Creator for this remarkable opportunity. The next morning, with all preparations complete, Joseph imbibes the potent liquid. The medicine soon takes effect. Joseph collapses into a deep dream state, which allows the spirit warrior's force to take over. David, the shaman, keeps a close watch on Joseph throughout the ceremony. David uses burning sage in a technique called smudging to ward off evil spirits. He also sprinkles tobacco as an offering to good ancestral spirits who attend and bring their gifts of knowledge. I was given wisdom. I was given flight. I was given freedom. Joseph recreated part of his spirit journey for our cameras. He literally had a near-death experience induced by the Datura. Joseph believes he was able to see into many beings and animals, and he actually perceived the spirit of rocks and trees and great creatures that live on the earth now or have lived in the past. I remember a, a ruin. I don't know whether it's in this land or not, but it was ancestral ruins, and I felt very peaceful there. I was flying into the fire. I was flying through the circle of the fire. I was flying into the spirit world and flying back out. That's when I saw Tom. Tom was there to receive the ceremony. And now it's his to give to someone else. search for the meaning of life, many traditionalists are seeking answers in the past for the questions of the future. In the Shoshone way, continuity is passed on from generation to generation through ancient ritual that blurs the boundaries between the spiritual and the mundane. It is important to remind our viewers the Datura is a deadly plant. It is used improperly. 
can cause death. This program is brought to you in part by Timex, makers of the new turn and pull alarm watch. Okay. Hi there, Michael Landrum here for Timex. Bringing you Timex's newest innovation, the Timex Turn and Pull Alarm Watch. Just turn the ring either way and pull the crown to set it for short or long-term reminders. Let's try setting it for 11 minutes. Just turn the ring and pull the crown. Next week, we'll discuss gum chewing. The Timex Turn and Pull Alarm Watch. So simple, we should have thought of it years ago. Watching the Discovery Channel. Discipline creates performance. Aim funds. The idea is discipline. The purpose is performance. The name is AIM. Most people do not see the world as it is. They see it as they are. She risked her honor to challenge tradition. You cannot shut the world out forever. Believe me, I've tried. He risked his life to save a nation. But to follow their hearts was the greatest risk of all. Promise me that I will see you again. And the King, rated PG-13, December 17th, only in theaters. Raising the Mammoth, coming March 2000. Night. Provides no ambient illumination. It's scary. Yet objects give off energy in the form of heat. It would be amazing if you could see what's out there. DeVille DTS thermal detection system with a head-up display projects images of the road ahead. Beyond the range of your headlamps. The all-new DeVille DTS, the world's first car available with night vision. The power of AND, the fusion of design and technology. Cadillac. You're watching the Discovery Channel. Think the world will come to an end when the new millennium begins? Well, consider this. The moon's moving away from Earth two inches every year. Life vest, anyone? If the sun was a little closer, we'd be. But if it moved further back, we'd be. Want to know more? Don't miss the cosmic doubleheader if we had no moon and savage sun. Monday at 9 Eastern and Pacific on the Discovery Channel. Explore your world and your sun and your... the most brilliant American film ever made. William Randolph Hearst used all his power to try and destroy it. Use the file. Liev Schreiber, James Cromwell, Melanie Griffith, Brenda Blethyn, Roy Scheider, and John Malkovich. That film will never see the light of day. RKO 281, coming in November. Discover the turbulent story behind America's greatest movie on HBO and Cox Cable. Frequently the most bizarre phenomena on the planet spring from Mother Nature herself. It can take decades for scientists to explain them, if indeed they ever do. And we're about to visit the sites of three distinct, yet bizarre creations of nature. Scientists have reached their conclusions. Let's see if you agree. In southeastern Pennsylvania, there is a mysterious field of boulders. How they got there has led to imaginative speculations, including ancient ruins, spaceship landing points, Indian ceremonial sites, and even witchcraft. 
However, the 20th century brought a scientific and rational explanation, not only for their origin, but why these rocks seem to ring when struck with a hammer. Ranger Marlin Korn explains. More than 155 million years ago, this entire area was under a giant lake, Lake Lakatong. Now, the lake laid down layers of sediment, which over the millions of years following hardened into layers of uh, sedimentary rock we call shale. About 155 million years ago, there was volcanic intrusion deep from within the earth, sending lava up into the upper layers of these shales. It's a uh, volcanic intrusion of molten rock, which hardened into a rock we call diabase. Because the igneous intrusion was so close to the surface, it cooled very rapidly. And the, uh, the, this caused a great stress on the crystalline structure of the rocks as they cooled. That combined with the high iron content gives the rocks a high resonance quality, and that's why they ring. Today we understand why these rocks ring. It wasn't really very long ago when scientific analysis replaced the superstitious or supernatural claims, underscoring how humans react when they just don't know. In another case of puzzling natural phenomena in the waters of the Bahamas, locals and scientists alike were perplexed until quite recently. For centuries, mysterious muds clouded the waters off Grand Bahama Bank. Here, a diver explores the site of a 17th century wreck. Soon, his vision is clouded by mud drifting into the area. and is apparent from the air. Huge drifting patches of muddy water called whitings off the region. What causes whitings? For decades, the mysterious phenomenon failed to yield its secrets. An American researcher, Eugene Shin, disproved the stirred up sediment theory and remained baffled by the true origin of the unusual manifestation. Dr. Lisa Robbins, a geologist from the University of South Florida, explains the research applied to the phenomenon and its incredible results. For a long time, these whitings were thought to just be stirred up from fish on the bottom of sediment. And this was shown to be not true by Gene Shin, who showed that there were not enough fish right in this Bahamian area to account for all this stirred up bottom sediment. We took it one step further to see if there was any kind of biological activity inside the water itself on this microscopic level. We found these tiny cyanobacteria that are actually precipitating, they're actually growing crystals around their cells. When they grow around the cell, they actually almost have a snowball looking effect. The cyanobacteria last about 24 hours, and during this 24-hour period, they um, grow the crystals around them. These crystals are the same type of crystals that you find in the sediment. All of this is the lime mud that we find on Great Bahama Bank. These large whitings can last for several days blanket miles of ocean as the crystal-covered bacteria drift with currents and tides. Black-tip sharks take up residence in the whitings as cover to hunt for prey. Using sensory organs called ampullae of Lorenzini as kind of a short-range radar, the sharks have a decided advantage in the murky environment. Space shuttle astronauts have been briefed on the phenomenon and are on the lookout for them worldwide. Whitings have been photographed from space in support of the research at the University of South Florida. So why all the fuss over what is essentially dirty water? And why would NASA want to help? Could there be any benefit to humanity? Well, these are photosynthetic bacteria, and so they are drawing down the carbon dioxide. In the process of drawing down the carbon dioxide out of the water, they may be also drawing down atmospheric carbon dioxide. 
We seem to have preliminary indications that show that carbon dioxide is being drawn out of the system through the cycling of the cell that's using carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide emissions from human sources may contribute to global warming. If the research proves out, cyanobacteria may be able to capture and hold CO2 for long periods, possibly thousands of years. In the future, is it too bizarre to envision ponds of artificially created whitings converting CO2 into calcium carbonate crystals and possibly help reverse global warming? Calcium carbonate, which figured so prominently in the whiting phenomenon, also plays a major role in our next investigation. The Beyond Bizarre crew of Bill McDonald and Brent Madden arrive at the CDAM cave diving headquarters in Puerto Aventuras, Mexico, to meet explorer Mike Madden. Mike made an astounding discovery that will lead our team to the site of a natural wonder, an incredible submerged cave system. Well, the cave that we're going to go to is a place called Nohoch Nichich. The unique thing about the, the cave is, is that it's uh, very beautiful and very shallow. So we're able to uh, explore this cave and not have to pay the penalty of decompression after diving. We're going to walk back through the jungle uh, about two kilometers, trekking, if you will, because you're going to be, uh, we're going to put all of the equipment on horseback and then we'll walk back through the jungle uh, to the uh, site and the equipment will be lowered then down on into a depression in the ground. This cave system is possibly one of the prime reasons the Mayans chose to settle in this otherwise hostile region. Not only is it a prime source of fresh water, but certain open water areas called cenotes may have been used for human sacrifice. Located some 100 kilometers south of Cancun, Mexico, near the ancient city of Tulum, the Nohutch cave system was first explored by Mike Madden in 1987. Translated from the Mayan language, Nohutch means huge or giant. True enough, for since 1992, the Nohutch cave system has been listed in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's longest underwater cave system with over 40 kilometers or 140,000 feet of explored passages. underwater tunnels, very similar in complexity to the New York subway system. Nature seems to have worked overtime to adorn these caverns with exquisite calcium carbonate formations. These stunning stalactites and stalagmites were created during the last great ice age over 12,000 years ago, when world water levels were dramatically lower than present day. At one point, the divers encounter a school of troglobitic catfish hovering beneath a large air pocket. The reason for the gathering of catfish becomes evident when the divers surface. Bats have taken up residence. Incredible as it seems, the catfish evolved a feeding behavior which can only be described as bizarre. Their primary source of food is bat droppings. This watery time capsule, hidden in the Yucatan jungle, has only been penetrated by a few cave divers. This exclusive film was the very first document of one of nature's more closely guarded secrets. Hi, I'm Chris Carter. I'd like to talk to you about a problem that can happen in your city, your community, to someone you love. The inability to tell the difference between a bid price and an ask price, a market order and a limit order, 
But thanks to programs like Web Shops, Schwab is making a difference. At Schwab branches across America, they'll teach you all about using the world's leading online broker. Pay attention. Just another way Schwab is helping to make smarter investors. How do you look up a stock symbol again? Journey far. Dig deep. The Maglite flashlight. The world's finest. Crafted from solid aircraft aluminum. Sealed at each end with high-grade rubber O-rings. With an exclusive patented self-cleaning switch. And a patented adjustable beam. The Maglite flashlight. American made to be brighter, tougher, more dependable. The Maglite is a work of art that works. A Maglite flashlight is the brilliant gift idea for any occasion. This holiday season, the biggest motion picture of all time is now the one DVD no collection should be without. Titanic. Take the voyage home on DVD. Think big. The GMC Convoy 2000 is here. Trucks with capabilities that will change the way you look at the road. Professional grade pickups, SUVs, and family vans designed better than they need to be. Like the incredibly smooth riding 2000 GMC Jimmy, an SUV with a full length steel frame, its backbone. Now get $2,000 cash back when you purchase select 2000 Jimmy models. GMC, do one thing, do it well. Now get the Wall Street Journal delivered for 13 weeks at just 57 cents a day, a 25% savings. Call now 800-544-7100. That's 800-544-7100 for the Wall Street Journal. You're watching the Discovery Channel. All this month, check out what's happening on the inside. There's a lot of medevacs, smashed hands, head injuries, concussions. Monday through Friday, a different story. The weapons are getting more sophisticated. The bad guys are getting smarter. A different perspective. Jason, I'm all that you have right now, okay? We were told not to look up or our heads would be blown off. In the series that takes you on the inside. I'd like to welcome you to the Universal Studios Hollywood. This is the hottest ride in the world, and uh, I'll be back. December premieres all this month. Good night. Go behind the scenes. And get the story from on the inside. Every weeknight at 8, Eastern and Pacific, on the Discovery Channel. You've seen it on CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS. I mean, this was a very big story. Most of the major media outlets really seem to jump on the story. A crew of underwater experts heads out to Discovery see. Channel. The Discovery Channel set out to The find. elusive Liberty Bell 7. Now, get the whole story. Astronaut Gus Grissom's space capsule makes its final journey home in search of Liberty Bell 7. Sunday, December 12th at 9, Eastern and Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. Most people love pets, but for a growing segment of the population, traditional pets are no longer enough. So they turn to unusual and exotic animals for companionship. It has been said the role of animals is not just amusement and wonder, but to offer a mirror of our own humanity. For thousands of years, we have used animals for our pleasure and to obey our will. In Egypt, big cats roam the palaces of the pharaoh. Wild animals in India, the tame, serve the needs of human masters. Even the deadly cobra has been drawn a demand's influence. Over the world, humanity has formed incredible and sometimes strange relationships with all manner of animals. In India, cows are sacred. In 
Indonesia's sacred eels fulfill a cultural need. In the submerged freshwater grotto on the island of Ambon, caretakers feed and pamper these eels as it has been done for centuries. Now, why would they do that? Considered to be reincarnated ancestral leaders, these fish are treated accordingly. All rituals in the community are dominated by the behavior of the eels. If they swim free in the grotto, it is considered very good luck. However, if the eels remain in hiding, all community ceremonies cease until their reappearance. Another native of Indonesia is the monitor lizard. This is Louie, a six-foot water monitor who now lives in Corona, California, and spends his time lazing in the family pool and eating. Monitor lizards have been around for 130 million years, but have not traditionally been kept as pets. I think lizards make really good pets especially the monitors, if you get the right ones, because they're very hardy animals. You know, they don't get sick all that often, and they don't eat all that much, really, and they're easy to care for, easy to clean up after. And... A full-grown monitor lizard can be a formidable adversary, but you can see that Louis seems totally docile and comfortable in the care of his devoted owners. His owner lovingly scoops him out of the pool to take him to a public exhibition of reptiles. Reptiles are very unique pets because you can have them in a condominium, you can have them in a townhouse, you can have them in a house, you can have them in an apartment and nobody really knows you have them. They're kind of like having a fish, but you can hold it, you can touch it, you can feed it, you can, it has response. This is a Jackson chameleon. They're found in Africa, in the mountains of Africa. Uh, they're a very popular pet item. Uh, they, this is a full-grown full adult. Uh, they breed well in captivity. They do well in captivity. They're very attractive. This is a male. You can tell by the three horns on his head. This is a plumifrom basilisk that came from South America. They, this is a full-grown adult male. The males have the high crest that come all the way back. They used to flare, to flare in combat with other males to scare them off. When uh, they breed well in captivity, and the females can lay 15 to 18 eggs. Traditionally, the difference between pets and livestock has been distinct. But as you shall see, in a growing number of situations, the difference is no longer as great as it once was. When one chooses a pet, size is frequently a consideration, and there is increasing interest in miniature animals. The DeBruce Ranch in Corona, California, specializes in breeding miniature horses. These scaled-down equines are intelligent and make excellent companions, so much so that they're used in therapeutic programs for people of all ages. This frisky critter has a pedigree that dates back to the 16th century, when miniatures were bred for the amusement of royalty at three weeks old. This colt is less than 20 inches tall. On the other hand, these full-size coats in Ramona, California, are hardly bizarre, except for one unique distinction. They faint and fall flat on the ground. Suffering from a genetic condition called myotonia, the muscles of the American fainting goat lock up when the animal is startled, and it frequently falls over. Myotonia is not painful to the goats. This is not a condition of the heart or um, a disease whereby they're hurt when they faint or fall over. Um, they're completely aware. They're not in pain at all. And it usually lasts five to 30 seconds. And then they come right back out of it and act as though nothing happened. Oddly, all known fainting goats seem to have originated from the same small flock purchased by a Tennessee farmer from a mysterious itinerant stranger in the 1880s. 
A ranch in Central California is home to an unusual menagerie of domestic animals whose lineage extends for thousands of years. Here at McCallany River Ranch, uh, we're the only one of its kind on the west coast of the United States. And we specialize in the research and the history and the genetic makeup of primitive and endangered breeds of sheep, goats, pigs, and cattle. Almost extinct, these primitive breeds of livestock are being kept genetically viable for a future time when their biodiversity may be needed to help feed the world's hungry masses. In the meantime, they are treated more like pets than livestock. As pets assume greater importance in our lives, some owners seek to take the relationship to a higher level. The owners of this pig named PJ have engaged the services of renowned pet psychic Lydia Hibby to give them some insight into PJ's thoughts. And he said, I, I hate it when people talk derogatorily about me. He says, I'm very much a personality and I like people. And he said, I really want to say hi to them. But he said, some of them just don't like me right away. And he gets very offended. Basically, they communicate to me through nonverbal communication. It's a form of ESP. It's picture talking. And they give me an image in my head. And they also give me the emotions and the feelings and the physical sensations. And hopefully, then I can make it into a dialogue that the owners can understand. Um, but there's a couple things about animals that are different. They only talk in positive terms. They can only tell you what's happening at the present moment, if that's all you're asking. And they don't have a time concept the way we do. They kind of run everything together. 30% of my business is also doing some lost pets, but also counseling owners that are in the process of putting an animal to sleep, which is always the serious side of my business because people wonder, am I doing it too soon? Have I waited too long? And all I can tell people about that in general is if you have a sense that it's time to put an animal to sleep, it's the animal telling you it's their time to go. The inevitable tragedy in a pet owner's life is losing the beloved companion to death. But even death doesn't always sever that special bond. Rod Shelton, a taxidermist in Sacramento, California, provides an alternative to parting at death. We've been involved with uh, the freeze-dry aspect of taxidermy for about 16 years, and the reason I got into that was mainly to do the more difficult items such as uh, pets like this and, and uh, the smaller animals for museums such as lizards and snakes. And, and uh, people are starting to accept the fact that maybe pets are the thing to have around. They've been very close to the family and maybe they're a prize winning breed. Maybe they're something very exotic such as a lizard or snake that's getting very rare or birds that are very rare. And they feel that something like that should be preserved for a long period of time. But there's others that just want to keep their pet because they just kind of they're getting older and that's been their closest friend and they're just don't want to give it up they, they don't want to imagine their animal in the ground being buried under under dirt or being cremated they they thought it was a beautiful animal and they still can enjoy that part of it whether the pets are cuddly or strange when living or stuff to be kept after death we can be assured that mankind's love affair with animals will continue to the end of time no matter how bizarre it may seem Discipline, the purpose is performance. The name is AIM. The Martins have just discovered something incredible about their robot. Have a good day, sweetheart. Have a good day, sweetheart. He can feel. He shows characteristics like curiosity, friendship. Good night, sweetheart. Good night, Andrew. Now, ah! he just has to convince the world. It's about following your heart. You have a heart, Andrew. I feel it. Robin Williams. I am trying to make something of myself. Bicentennial Man. Jump. No! Out the window. Rated PG. Starts Friday, December 17th. You are watching the Discovery Channel. The 
toy store favored by families for generations cool. has inspired KBKids.com with thousands of toys, from hard-to-find learning toys to the hot toys kids just gotta have. Look at that. Cool. KBKids.com. We get toys as well as any grown-ups can. Cool. KBKids.com. We get toys. Order now and you'll get shipping absolutely free. Think the world will come to an end when the new millennium begins? Well, consider this. The moon's moving away from Earth two inches every year. Life vest, anyone? If the sun was a little closer, we'd be. But if it moved further back, we'd be. Want to know more? Don't miss if we had no moon and savage sun. Monday at 9 Eastern and Pacific on the Discovery Channel. Brought to you by Ford Outfitters. No boundaries. In my house, I have a stair climber. In my house, In my house I have a stationary bike. In my house, I have a treadmill. In my house, a rowing machine. And they're all collecting dust. Get out there and explore in your Ford Outfitter. Outfitting you with the most far-reaching sport utilities on earth. Ford Outfitters. No boundaries. All this week at 8, go on the inside. The series that takes you behind the scenes. Come on, turn around, put your hands behind your head. Now! Tell me straight out, who you running with no, now? Who you claiming? Next, the real LAPD hearts and minds. You guys got the rest of your lives and you guys are going to blow it. And Friday, submarine disasters, deep secrets. All this week at 8, Eastern and Pacific, get the story from on the inside. On the Discovery Channel, explore your world. To succeed in business, you need a good idea and the vision to make it happen. Of course, having one of the world's most reliable fiber optic networks on your side doesn't hurt either. With Cox Business Services, success isn't a goal, it's a given. Cox Business Services, now you're living. Light up for Christmas at Christmas Village. Come to Christmas Village for all your decorating needs. Trees, lights, wreaths, garlands, gifts, and more, all at Christmas Village on Veterans. You won't believe our huge selection of lighted outdoor figures. Over 200 different items on display, now at 20% off. That's right, 20% off our huge selection of lighted outdoor figures at Christmas Village in the big green building at 4040 Veterans Boulevard. Call 888-7254. That's 888-7254. terror in the dreams of mankind for centuries. The folklore of most peasant cultures across Europe is filled with the vivid images of corpses rising from their graves to terrorize village populations. They are the undead. In 1734, the Oxford Dictionary officially placed them in the lexicon. We call them Vampires. Bram Stoker's Dracula was published in 1897 and culminated a 200-year epidemic of vampirism in Europe. Folklore was rife with stories of the undead who would arise from the ranks of the godless. Their graves were frequently desecrated to make sure the bodies were indeed dead. Driving a stake through the heart of a suspected vampire's corpse was an accepted prophylactic measure. Blood or body fluids spurting from the wounds led to the legends of blood-sucking vampires and fear of the undead swept the continent. The rush to this obsessive fear is not without precedent. Historically, the ritual drinking of blood has been a vital element in sacrifice, presumably helping one to attain power or appease the gods. Mankind is a long history of bloodletting in many forms. As blood is vital to life, it was often considered to have magical properties. To many indigenous peoples, the drinking of blood is still a common practice. 
instance, Maasai herdsmen regularly consume blood from their cattle as a necessary component of their diet. As disagreeable as drinking blood might be to many of us, it is still a large leap from primitive rituals to supernatural vampirism. The fictional vampire is a complex literary construct. Author Bram Stoker drew upon existing folklore and the bloody history of Romania's 15th century hero, Vlad Tepes, otherwise known as Vlad Dracul, or Son of the Devil. While bloodthirsty even by the standards of his time, Vlad Dracul was not a vampire. As far as anyone knows, he never drank the blood of his enemies. However, it was said he enjoyed dining under the impaled bodies of his victims. To Vlad, impalement was a fine art and meant a slow and hideous death to his enemies, the Turks. His castle, top a Carpathian ridge, may now be in ruins, but that didn't stop American author Vincent Hillier from spending a night there alone. The wind was blowing and the castle stood at the top of a mountain looking like a, a gray antique skeleton. I crossed a little narrow drawbridge, walked in, and as soon as the sun set, the first thing I heard were the wolves. During the night when I went to sleep, I heard thumps in the castle, and then I turned and looked down the hall, and I had the impression that I was being watched. Of course, when you feel you're being watched in Castle Dracula, this is not the greatest place to have this occur. I picked up my lantern and walked down, and as I approached, I saw two eyes following me, large and watery, watching every movement. And at the end of the hall, I fully expected to hear a voice say, welcome. Instead, what I found was a big wolf that was standing there. He had come in through a break in the walls, and he was looking at me, and I looked at him, and he blinked first because he turned and ran. Vlad Dracul was assassinated around 1477. The actual location of his remains is still uncertain. One likely spot is on Snagoff Island in a Romanian church near the altar. Excavations there in 1931 were inconclusive, except for one possible corpse. Many have claimed Vlad's bones. One bizarre example is in Hollywood's weird museum within their unique collection of monstrosities. We've had the remains carbon dated and all the dates match up. Even the greatest experts on Dracula today believe that these are uh, the final remains of the prince. While Vlad Dracul's remains may be lost, Count Dracula memorabilia can be found at the Dracula Museum in New York City. The curator, Dr. Gene Youngson, is there to share the collection with people who study vampire behavior, like Eric Hell, publisher of the Vampire Information Exchange newsletter. What we try to do is we try to cater to those who feel they're vampires and those who feel they're just the casual fan. Of the 500 members, it would be very difficult to gauge how many of them feel that they are vampires in one way or another. There are still many people who will practice, but won't let anyone else know. Uh, of those that I do know, I, I would say there are approximately 75 to 100. We also have many, or some members, who feel that the daytime is detrimental that they feel very drained and weak during the daytime, so they will purposely get jobs at night and purposely revolve their life around the night and do their sleeping during the day. Unlike fictional characters, contemporary vampires don't turn into bats or live forever, yet they definitely have a thirst for human blood, as we shall see next. You know, people still ask me about the crash. I'm tired of talking about the crash. I mean, first of all, it wasn't even really a crash. 1929, that was a crash. Yeah, that was bad. 98 was more like a market correction, typically defined by like 10, 20% drop in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which if you consider the economic factors that are affecting the current risk premiums. When we created a smarter kind of investment firm. I guess it's not that surprising. We created a smarter kind of investor. What do you know about expense ratio? An expense ratio is a percentage. The Mammoth, coming March 2000. Intrigue 
is now the first and only mid-size car with the precision control system. It gives you better control over the unexpected. Intrigue by Oldsmobile. Start something. You're watching the Discovery Channel. Have a look. She came to a world she did not know. Have you any friends in Bangkok? No. With customs she couldn't understand. Women do not stand in the presence of His Excellency. And a king she would never forget. Jodie Foster, Chow Yun Fat, Anna and the King, rated PG-13. December 17th, only in theaters. You're watching the Discovery Channel. Some things you just can't afford to miss, like Discovery News, the only primetime science newscast on television. Discovery News takes you beyond the obvious and into the science behind the headlines. Discovery News, understanding what happened, why it happened, and the impact it has on our lives. Discovery News, if you miss it, you miss out. Fridays at 9 Eastern and Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. All this week at 8, go on the inside. The series that takes you behind the scenes. Turn around, put your hands behind your head. Now! Tell me straight out, who you running with? No, I'm, who I'm you crazy. claiming? Next, the real LAPD hearts and minds. You guys got the rest of your lives, and you guys are going to blow it. And Friday, submarine disasters, deep secrets. All this week at 8, Eastern and Pacific, get the story from on the inside. On the Discovery Channel, explore your world. In our hunger to experience the bizarre and fantastic, interest in vampires is at an all-time high. Today there is a disconcerting trend wherein people have taken vampirism well beyond the realm of folklore and fiction. A gothic subculture is spread across America, complete with artificial fangs, dramatic makeup, and costuming. David Skull, expert on vampires in literature and movies, helps us explore this strange phenomenon. Monsters and vampires are perennially popular, as is evidenced by this elaborate stage set at Universal Studios Florida for the Beetlejuice Graveyard Review. But there is a certain segment of the population that is not content to leave monsters and vampires to the movies and uh, have actually begun to uh, uh, imitate the feeding habits of, of vampires in real life. Now, these blood fetishists have been known to the psychiatric literature for well over a century, but it has only been in the last decade with this incredible swelling of interest in, in Dracula and vampires, uh, the novels of Anne Rice, uh, Carol Page's book, uh, Bloodlust, that they have begun to identify in a very positive way with the traditional image of the vampire, with the cloaks and the capes and the candelabras and the cobwebby castles. Katrina Coffin, one of hundreds of self-proclaimed vampires, lives in a dusty house decked out with ghastly possessions. Her companion animals include snakes, scorpions, and tarantulas. Katrina has worked very hard to make her home look like a horror movie set. Here, she is interviewed by writer Carol Page, author of Bloodlust, Conversations with Real Vampires, to discuss this emerging American obsession. Do you think you were born a vampire? Um, for me, yes, I would say I probably was. I have loved the taste of blood as far back as I can remember. Blood coming from someone else is 
there's an intimacy to it mm -hmm. when it comes from another person. Mm -hmm. It is different than, than drinking your own blood, and mm -hmm. I prefer it from someone else. A medical scalpel is very, very sharp, and therefore it really doesn't cause any pain. And as I say, I don't cut deep enough to hurt anyone seriously. Mm -hmm. And it's just the pleasure comes from the intimacy of being with the person and taking the blood from the wound. I wrote Bloodlust more as an accident than anything. Uh, I had been reading about the reality of vampires, and I thought it sounded like a crock to me. So I started to look into it a little bit, and I discovered an extraordinary subculture. Dharma, another vampirist, belongs to a blood-drinking cult. It includes a member who is a phlebotomist, somebody who actually has a license to draw blood. Once the blood flows, I think it's as close as two people can get. I mean, blood is the essence of your life, and when someone is drinking your blood, to me that's um, a lot deeper than sex because it's you. It's, it's what you are. It's, it's what makes you. It's what can break you. I mean, if they take too much, you know, they can kill you or whatever. But it, when, when you drink it, you, you feel the other person's life. It's so intimate to have somebody else's, for one thing. That makes me a lot higher than, than my own because, I mean, the whole, the whole idea of drinking of someone's life and their, their essence, and it's, it's, it becomes a part of you. It goes into your body. Donating blood and receiving blood are both really intense experiences, and donating can happen in a number of ways, and all of them make it different. Like, if, um, as in the video, um, it's withdrawn with a blood drawing syringe, Violet's a professional phlebotomist. So that's a very safe and clean method. For those interested in vampire teeth, they may only need to contact their local dentist for temporary or permanent fangs. I've been involved uh, making designer teeth for almost uh, 20 years, actually. A lady named Danielle called me up one day and, and um, asked if I could make vampire fangs, and I said, sure. If a person wants to have vampire teeth, if that's what a person wants, easy to do, takes about 15 minutes, shouldn't cost an arm and a leg. And totally, just like a mask, put on your face and take off. Something a little more permanent than that, you could have bonding put on the tooth uh, that wouldn't be totally expensive, but that would be more of a permanent application. I have a friend whose are very out there, but mine are, you know, they could be my own. When people notice them, I never, I never tell them they're not, that I wasn't born with them, you know. For all they know, I was born with a pack of wolves. I just, I like that feeling that, yeah, it's different. Her canines are really pronounced. <laughs> The attraction of the fictional vampire is easy to see. Of all our monsters, they are probably the most dangerous, the most human. They represent the dark, the cult side of our humanity. And when vicarious danger becomes obsessive and life imitates fiction, we cross the threshold to well beyond bizarre. We live in a high-tech world. We've come to expect all mysteries and problems to ultimately succumb to the scrutiny of science and the wizardry of technology. Yesterday's science fiction fantasy is today's everyday occurrence. But it's strangely comforting to know that there are still mysteries, phenomena, and people beyond the expected or believable that don't fit the mold defy scientific explanations. Until next time, I'm Jay Robinson, bringing you back to the everyday world, far removed from the realm that is beyond bizarre. From Baltimore to Brazil, your ticket is waiting at discovery.com. Click on our live cam site anytime and explore your world. Next, they risk themselves to stop war in the streets. The gang unit of the LAPD on the inside coming up.